So thank you so much for your time and um, turning up for what we um, fully believe will be a divine encounter today. Um, all of the admirers, dancers, enthusiasts, students, and everyone else who joined us, thank you for being here. Um, I want to make a quick announcement about the recording. Um, this is being recorded, just so you all know, and several people have asked me about the recording. Um, there's no immediate plans to publish it, but um, at the discretion of Revital and uh, Colina, it may be uh, available in the future. Um, and I just want to talk for a moment by way of introduction, um, how this conversation with these two amazing dancers who are gonna share about their lives and experiences and successes with us uh, came to be. So um, I'm a longtime student of Revital and have just met Colina this year and, and started practicing and studying with Colina. And um, I've done many, many private sessions with Revital because we, we tend to be on opposite sides of the globe a lot. So we do um, online Zooms and oftentimes I'd ask a few questions afterwards and, uh, you know, about theory or spirituality or what I was noticing in my body or, you know, some challenges I were, was having. And we would dive into these really rich and interesting conversations. Uh, you know, as everybody knows, Odyssey is such um, a rich art form. And, you know, we just had the idea that it, it would be great to open this conversation and share it. And then of course I met, as we were planning this, um, I had the opportunity to study with Colina at her um, summer Shakti school on Crete. And it just seemed natural that you know, we come together and, and share this conversation because I know that um, Rebital and Polina have a very sweet connection as well. So um, we're very honored to be here with these internationally acclaimed dancers. And um, before we launch into some questions and conversation, I just wanna take a moment um, to invoke sacred space. Um, we're inviting and witnessing our teachers and sisters as they share intimate details about their experiences, their lives, their challenges, and um, appreciate their willingness to share with us in a public forum um, so that we can be inspired and honor their accomplishments and success, as well as this exquisite art form. Um, so thank you, Revital and Colina, for being generous with your time um, in offering this today. And um, I'd like to just take a few deep breaths together and invoke sacred space. Um, so why don't we uh, all just feel our feet on the floor. Feel your bottom on the seat. Feel your backbone. And let's take a few deep breaths together and just really arrive here. For this purpose and with the intention to honor our teachers. And in your own body, notice any sensations, any discomforts, make any physical adjustments necessary or as desired, so you can be very comfortable and present. Just notice any emotional energy that is present and welcome it into this space and appreciate these sensations for their great capacity for wisdom and insight. And as we become acutely present with ourselves, we can also be sensitively present with others in this moment with our dear friends, sisters, and teachers, 
Revital and Colina. So fantastic. Welcome everybody. And Revital and Colina, do you want to say hello? Yeah. <laughs> I want to say hello. So um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here in this um, forum with all of you, especially, I mean, of course, with Colina and Jan as um, my uh, creators of this sacred circle and all of you who joined us. And I'm, I'm excited to dive in. So welcome. And uh, I guess I just want to say one little technical thing is that um, on your left bottom of your screen, there is the stop video. So if your video is playing, if you can actually stop the video and just keep it uh, off. So um, Colina, myself and Jen can be, you know, the only ones on video. And then also, if you haven't muted yourself, there's the microphone on the very left bottom corner, and you can also make sure that it's stay muted. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You want to say hello, Kalina? Oh, I think she just froze. Oh. I feel I think she may have dropped off and I'm sure she'll be back. So, um, oh, is she back? Not yet. Okay, well, um, why don't we get started, Revital, and then we will catch her up as soon as she logs back in. Yeah. Um, yes. So, I think a great first question. A really interesting and juicy first question for both of you is, um, can you describe the moment you first fell in love with ODC dance? And what was it about ODC that called to your heart in such a profound way that you dropped everything, moved to India and devoted your life to this art form? So I suppose I will answer that question first, since Kalina is still trying to get back online. So um, I feel like when I search the answer for this kind of multi-layered question, there is the, the first thing that sort of come in the forefront for me that really kept me engaged and kept me falling in love with this art form over and over and over because it's not necessarily, you know, a Hollywood movie where I fell in love and lived with Odyssey happily ever after kind of a thing, but it's more twists and turns for me and, you know, turned arounds and, and spirals and waves. And, um, and what is really cut, lodged so deep in my body and in my heart and in my pelvis and in my, being is that beautiful dance and, and um, interwoven principles of this dance form, its tradition and its energetics and its qualities of practice that bring the sensual and the spiritual into a beautiful interwoven expression. And that is at the core of what keeps me coming back into the dance floor and into the altar and into, into the practice. So that is really the core for me of, of, the, of the answer for this question. But in terms of you know, the moment when I fell in love with it, I was already in India. I came to India really in um, the quest of a spiritual um, experience. So the spiritual longing is really what propelled me to travel to India and to take on different practices. And I practiced yoga and meditation. And I started, um, I came across classical Indian dance, but it wasn't Odissi initially. It was Bharatanatyam in the deep south. And then I ended up, ended up in Banaras, Varanasi, and studied Kathak for about a year. But somehow those dance forms didn't really stick. And I mean, I did 
fall in love, but it, you know, it was just a, a fling. It wasn't like a lifelong love story. And then when I went to Orissa, which was a sort of circumstances, I had some friends who, who lived there and invited me to uh, a healing retreat. And we, we all came together and um, she took me to see a performance of Orissi dance at Raghurajpur, which is the birthplace of Guru Kelucharan Mohbatwa. Mm -hmm. And it's an ancient village in uh, Orissa, not too far from Puri. And uh, it has this very old, I don't know how old, but it's an ancient temple of the goddess of, of Devi. And it's all, you know, wooden temple behind and a wooden stage. And it's, it's standing rather lonely in the, in the middle of that village. And um, it's an artist village. Everybody in this village are artists. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, some kind of a full moon celebration. And the offering for the goddess was Odyssey dance on that stage, right in front of that temple. Mm -hmm. And somehow that moment in time, you know, the, the astrology and the geography and the moment in, of time in my life that all it all came together, it's, it felt like it's instantly lodged into my body. It was this deep recognition of, of the movement, of the form, of the music, of the sentiment. Mm. It truly felt divine and mesmerizing beyond belief. It almost felt like I'm leaping out of my body to, to, to be there on stage with his dancers. And, um, and that was the beginning for me. I mean, long story short, that was the beginning for me. I was like, this is it. This is what I want to learn. There was no doubt in my heart that I have to experience this. And, so it was like um, a love at first sight. <laughs> yeah, and as I say, there were a lot of twists and turns, and I fell off, you know, the the, the practice and, and came back to it and and all of that. But um, but that is uh, my first moment, and as I said, the 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 big um, allure is that. Um, beautiful dance between the sensual and the spiritual coming together in this um, art form for me. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And mm -hmm. uh, while we're waiting for Colina to log back on, I hope she gets um, back on. She's easily. on. Ah, she's back. She's on. Okay, let me find her. I just have to pin her. Uh, Jen, I do think you need to pin um the three of us because when if anyone else unmutes then they they come up as um well Revital is pinned and you were pinned before you went off so i will pin you again <coughs> all right there you go oh thank you uh sunaz is mentioning it has to be spotlight <laughs> i'm right, using the spotlight. Spotlight. It be, um it should be on the the three dots and the um top right corner should give you the option to spotlight like for everyone okay, nice. and that's gonna remove everybody else which i don't want to do but then i'll try and because i don't want to remove revital um i think you need to i was saying pin but what i meant was spotlight you have to spotlight me you right. and revital. that's it no. <laughs> um, there's another I wanted to say that before I lost connection. <laughs> okay, so you're back. All right, we we kind of got started, um, and maybe you heard some of that, Kulina. And I just want to say to um, people as well, if you want to put some questions in the um, chat, you're welcome to do that. And as there's uh, time, we'll check in on that and see if uh, we can offer some questions to. Revital and Colina. So um, what we were kind of riffing about while you were gone, Colina, is, you know, what was your point, your first point of 
um, wow, ODC, like this is it for me. You know, what was that moment that you fell in love and fell in love so much that you decided, you know, I'm going to change my whole life and move to India and um, here we go. Can you talk about that a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, I, I got to hear Ravita uh, speaking and and I just want to say like to kind of introduce my my gratitude to be here. Um, I just love listening to Ravital's story because I just felt like I went into this story, you know, like journeying to Orissa. I just felt like I was at the end of the planet um, so far from home and and having this profound experience through my years there. And then um, I just love to hear Ravital's story because we went through such a similar experience. Um, so I, I appreciate everything you said, Ravital. And usually whenever we talk, we're like, yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> we we really share the same feelings. So I I second everything that she said, but um the the moment that I saw ODC, um, I didn't know what it was that struck me. Um not at that moment. I think um spiritually emotionally um i wasn't mature enough to understand what was working but isn't that kind of like all the subtle arts like you know even body work or um spiritual work you you kind of think it's happening on one layer but then at the same time there's 100 layers at work underneath the surface so um i remember i i saw odc I was um, I had I was learning belly dance and I just became obsessed with Middle Eastern music and culture and the idea of embodying another cultural um, view, particularly of my own feminine body of um, em embodying another femininity besides um, uh, recently in a in a university program I'm doing right now, we had to introduce uh, how we learned about our body and just we had to bring an image to class and the image that I brought was um, an image of Baywatch. <laughs> I grew up in the 90s in California. So that's kind of like this body as I was going through puberty and becoming a woman, that's like the body that was presented to me. And then I remember when I found belly dance, there was this whole other idea of my feminine body. And then when I saw Odissi, I was in university and I um, literally found a book in the library with a picture of Madhvi Mudgal. And I was just, it just blew my mind. The idea of this femininity is possible. I didn't, I didn't even, she was in a tripangi position, this very, languid, feminine, voluptuous position, and yet such a such a control and restraint and refinement and grace and a power, but also a surrender. So all these qualities that I just had not encountered in my in my where I grew up and the culture and the time and the place and the position that I grew up in. Um, so I was struck by the aesthetic of Odissi, but then as I, you know, years later, I, I look back and I realize um, the thing that struck me was the potential that the physical could lead us to ultimate spiritual transcendence. I mean, that the, that the body, using the body in a fun and beautiful and celebratory way, such as dance and music, I mean, it's fun and it's beautiful at its at its most basic level, but then there's so many layers inside of it that initially the attraction was the aesthetic of it, but then over the years, it's um, it's like, oh wow, this is this is um, toning my um, my self esteem, the vision of my body. This is toning uh, spiritual potential as I embody these different archetypes and I embody different uh, this very, very um, pious version of femininity, which is um, not something we often encounter these days. That, that's a striking thing about Odyssey is that the piety that is presented 
um, and also the sensuality as being, um, uh, yeah, it's a divine feminine and, and, you know, these looking at femininity and the body as even that sexuality or sensuality that is within our dancing body um, that is, that is divine and, um, and a path. So, um, yeah, there's a lot in there that, I mean, the initial contact and then really the question is why, why did you, why did you stay with ODC? You know, it's like that love at first sight, but then the relationship's been going on for so long, uh, for both of us, I think, um, we just keep, we keep falling in love again and again, and then you find more layers and more depths, um, and just continuously following falling in love and and following the mystery because the more we learn about such a complex art form as odyssey um you start learning about the um mythology and the archetypes that we're embodying and then you can follow that path and then the music the complexity of the music and then we follow that and um the idea of this transcendent body and we follow the connections with yoga um so yeah <laughs> all, that. all that yeah amazing it's it's really rich um and i can say just as a a person that came and i'm sure everybody has a story you know that moment when they were first captivated when i first attended kind of randomly attended a class with revital i had never seen odc before um, it was that once this like shocking experience for my body, like, wow, what just happened? Um, and, and I actually remember, you know, it came much later in life, even being in pain for a while because it was just such a different way of moving. But at the same time, like, oh, where have you been all, all of my life? Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, that had a lot to do with Revital's transmission as well so I, I can totally resonate with uh everything that you're both sharing about uh, the wealth that this ma magical art form has to share um so i'd love to ask also you know in in, in studying you've both spent a whole lot of time in India, living and um, studying in India. What has that been like for you? How, um, how has that affected your life? And uh, yeah, what's it like to spend so much time there for those of us that have maybe just visited or maybe never visited India? Hmm. Kalina, do you wanna go first this time? <laughs> okay um okay what uh so it what is it like to <clears throat> to kind of, to kind of arrive in in india to study classical dance i think i think um when also when both of us arrived it was just you know things have have changed so much but um my experience was there just were not many foreigners <clears throat> i mean you heard you heard the legends of a few foreigners before, and there was there's a few examples of foreign students who had come to study Odissi um, over the last several decades, but it was a very, a very foreign experience. I mean, arriving, um, I personally didn't really have any context of what it is like to live in India and, and um, it's a matter of learning to dress differently, to speak differently, to eat different food, to behave. The idea of being a young woman is very different. Um, personal space, um, you know, personal freedoms and things that um, things we might value, you know, in different places of the world. It's just such a different culture. Um, so it was extremely difficult uh in the beginning because for me not many people spoke english in in my uh context my my teacher didn't really speak english and i was training with 
young teenage boys, Odia boys. Um, and so for those of you who don't know Odissi so much, Odissi is connected to a tradition where young boys train in an acrobatic form of Odissi, which is known as Gotipoa dance. And it, the training is very, um, I guess you could imagine it like a, like a circus arts training or um, it's very intense training and, and a young boy's body is very different than my um, my body. So the thing that is that was so uh, obvious was that this big white body that I am <laughs> in a classroom of very different bodies. And that was shocking for so many people. Um, not not so many people in the neighborhood where I was living had ever seen a white person in real life in front of them let alone a tall white person you know and so it was like literally just going out of my house to walk to the school um you know it, people would walk you know come across me in the road and oh, like this kind of response day after day after day and and so it's something very much about the body because we didn't speak the same language so they couldn't say wow you're from California or what you know it wasn't my story that was shocking it was my body um so I just remember feeling so uncomfortable in my body because of that and because of the rigorous training um something like that really got me is I had never really broken a sweat before in my life <laughs> before going to Orissa which is a very hot tropical climate to train in an extraordinarily difficult dance. And I remember that feeling of like sweating for the first, I mean, not just sweating, like wringing my clothes out with sweat, mopping the floor after I was dancing because I sweat puddles. And, and it's extremely uncomfortable. And when I think back to that time, it's just like, how I felt in my body was so awkward and so painful and so bizarre. And then here I am trying to embody this graceful divine dance. It just didn't feel how it looks when you see it on the stage. It's so pretty, costume is so pretty, everything is in its place. And you just feel like, you know, sweaty and, and tired and painful. Um, so that was, that's been my life pretty much. And so now, so now um, I, I definitely realized uh, at some point in my life, if, if I'm just uncomfortable, I, I'm growing. So as long as I'm uncomfortable, I, I seem to be doing the right thing. And those years of just being so uncomfortable, like culturally uncomfortable um, in my body, just pushing and pushing and pushing, um, those are the years that that really made me dig deep and and find an inner strength to kind of to, to keep going. Um, it was really, um, yeah, just so indescribably uncomfortable. And and I just had to find uh, this inner fire. Um, and, and in the beginning, it wasn't the spiritual you know, it didn't, I wasn't going to India, I didn't go to India to have a spiritual experience. I, um, I just, you know, I went because there was something calling me. And so it wasn't quite clear to me what was calling me. And now it, the transformation is hopefully underway. And so I, I can, I can reflect on that spirit was beckoning me through a very uncomfortable um uh training period uh which you know i'm still engaged in the training i never i hope i never end that training um because it's transformative but but definitely the the beginning years were um were very uncomfortable <laughs> and it's amazing that you stayed through all of that you were you were young and you know something somehow some Part of you knew through all of that discomfort, you stayed. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. So yeah. beautiful. I definitely can relate to, to a lot of it. And um, 
you know, the whole training with the Gotse um, with, with a with a young boy was really uh, also my beginning with Odyssey was in a Gurukul, a Gotse Pua Gurukul. And um, being a, a big white woman, you know, with all those young, I mean, there were three teens for sure. They were like, uh, well, anything between like six to 16. So they were really young boys and uh, we were like right there with them. I was actually the only one for a while, um, right there with them, you know, doing all the, the choker steps and the tribangis and exercise and all of that. Um, it was definitely, uh, so I actually arrived in ODC after I have been living in India for years on and off. So, um, when I first came to India, I pretty quickly, um, well, when I first came to India, I felt, well, first you get that sensual assault. I mean, it's mm -hmm. such a sensual place. I mean, the, the, the amount of scents that are in the air at any given moment, it's impossible to, to integrate. And uh, the explosion of flavors, you know, every time you put something in your mouth, it's either way too spicy or way too sweet and uh, or way too sour or something. It's way too something. It's just like the experience of too much. It's so quintessential India. It's too much colors and it's too much, you know, smells and it's too much noise and it's too crowded and it's just, too much. And um, that feeling in the one hand felt, you know, too much. But on the other hand, it felt like it still does. Every time I come to India, there's this feeling of like Mother India is embracing me. Like the, the fabric of life is so tightly woven that I feel like the air and the air is so thick, you know, it's so humid that I feel like it's hugging me with all of this sensual explosion. And, um, and then I, you know, rode those waves and, and became a pretty wild yogini kind of woman, you know, like have a lot of experience living in, in, in caves and with sadhus and, and really going into the, the wilderness and into nature. And so a couple of few years later, when I did end up in Orissa for the first time, um, actually initially was in, the, in nature for a few weeks. And then I was getting ready to, to take on the practice of Orisi. And for me, that was a moment of entering into what I felt like was real India, like really living within the context of sort of everyday people's culture in, in a village. But uh, still there was a lot of uh, relig relig religion that was uh, around. There was a lot of rules and you know ways of being ways of eating and ways of sleeping and ways of going about ways of going to the bathroom that you had to follow you know you have to follow the rules you had to I had to dress properly all of a sudden I had to put my bangles and my bendy and my earrings and my necklace and my um, sindhu and my um, you know the whole thing I had to to be a lady <laughs> all of a sudden <laughs> because you know I was part of the family I had to represent and uh, and that was a big deal for me um, and uh, it was in a way initiation also into what does it mean to be an Indian woman because you know my family didn't want me to go alone to the market and I was like what do you mean I've always gone alone to the market <laughs> and I had to sort of um, check keep my my ego my my um, identification with um, myself as an independent woman somewhat aside so uh, not that I was going to be 
letting anybody control me, God forbid, or God is forbid, but still I had to play the game. And I found that by playing the game and by submitting my, you know, strong will to something greater than me, that kind of um, act of surrendering, act of, of letting go of something that was so familiar and, and, and dear to me, which was my independence, which is kind of putting it aside for a moment, was uh, opening uh, such a a big um, treasure chest of uh, of uh, of gems of experiences because my respect to my family to my teacher to my to my teacher's um, tribe to my teacher's um, larger family was opening so many doors to me while I was I was able to really drop in and, and become one of them they recognize my uh, sincerity and my dedication, and were able to give me so much more of the, of, of the depth of what is behind the dance, you know, of the deeper practices and, and really being part of that kind of uh, inner sanctum of their, of their life. And, and, and this is, to me, where I could really understand, um, sort of have a window into the, the lineage and into their ancestors and into the unspoken teaching, the teaching that perhaps they themselves were not aware of, that was just coming through them of because of who they are, because of the environment that they have been living and, and practicing and growing in. And, and that was very um, profound and, and precious, and it was worth all the, all the sweating. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one funny thing is that, you know, the, the people that I've danced with in Orisa always come to me and say, you're so tall, you're so beautiful. And I think, I'm so tall, I'm so ugly. <laughs> You know, I'm a giant, you know, and they think that's just so gorgeous, you know, but it's so hard to, to sit in choker when you're so tall. So I have made it a point to, to always tell my teacher, you are, I mean, sorry, tell my students, you are perfect. You are perfect. You know, we are short and tiny. You're perfect. You are tall and heavy. You're perfect. Whatever shape you are, you are in the perfect shape to practice this form because this form this art form will shape you no matter what so and sit um, down and choka <laughs> sit down <laughs> sit down and choka <laughs> and colina does that too <laughs> yes oh, beautiful wow so rich and um <laughs> Um, was there more Revital or do you feel complete with that question? No, I feel, I feel complete. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was um, really great. Thank you. And, you know, from these beginnings, you both have 20 some odd years on, you've both become world-class dancers. Um, you've performed in India, you've performed around the world. I mean, these worldly experiences, how have they shaped you as a woman? And how have they shaped uh, your worldview? You wanna go first? <laughs> sure. Um, I would like to relate to it as a dynamic present time um, activity, it still is, I still uh, find myself uh, being shaped. And, um, you know, my, my views are, are, are always being shaped and, and my um, identity as a woman is also something that is um, continuously being shaped. And um, I find that, um, there is uh, something that uh, Colina actually said in the response to the first question about that beautiful um, control with trains. 
in the form of Orisi that allows the, the femininity, the sensuality, and the, even the sexuality to, to, be, to be revealed in a very divine kind of light or context. And um, that principle of, of control in this dance form has really allowed me to feel more free to express my, myself in a way that, that is feeling safe. I feel safe to be a woman mm -hmm. and I feel um, respected and supported by, by the dance form. There's something about practicing Orisi that is both um, accentuating my femininity and curbs it at the same time mm -hmm. or you know keep it intact and and uh, and uh, I mean maybe the word control sounds a little bit uh, has too much of an edge to it sounds a little too strong but uh, nevertheless I think that uh, we we all uh, need to have a, you know we need to have a vessel to to hold the the precious nectar what can't just spill all over the place and I think that I was a little bit more spilling all over the place when I was young and um, and there's something about finding or is something that you know uh, strength and developing the fluidity that was uh, that still is every time I, I practice it's like oh it's like I can take a big breath and I can really be beautiful because I feel safe to be beautiful. It's really the, what, what uh, comes to me. And, and I also feel very empowered by practicing dance. I feel empowered to inhibit my form as a woman mm -hmm. and to express my views, to express myself. And in fact, I feel um, the power of expressing myself without words, expressing myself with a glance, you know, expressing myself with, with, you know, with my body in a way that is very sophisticated. It's nothing um, um, short of, um, nuanced and complex and sophisticated. Um, and yet it's, it's physical and it's where I feel um, in my element. I've never, um, I've actually um, never saw myself as someone who can uh, stand in front of an audience of people and, and share something of value. I, I uh, see myself as a very shy person but uh, I think that through the dance, I've felt very empowered to stand in front of a classroom. And if I'm going to teach a dance uh, class, it's like, I'm, I'm on top of the mountain. I'm in my element. I'm, I'm happy. And I have a lot to share all of a sudden, you know. Uh, but if you take me out of the classroom, I don't know who am who am I <laughs> what who am I to say to share to teach anything you know to share anything I I know nothing mm -hmm. kind of a thing um, so I think that there is something about and and it's the same on the stage if you put me on a stage I feel empowered to share my art because I feel like I'm on a on a mission, I feel like I'm on my path, and I feel like the 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 path is there. The journey is is uh, is is begging to to happen, and uh, I have no choice. I guess I mean, really, when it comes to entering the stage, we have no choice. The music is there, and the audience is there, and we must take our position in the cosmic play and that is a powerful kind of constellation to install ourselves in 
And I swear, I told myself, I mean, for the first hundred performances that I have done, if not more, I've told myself over and over, like the second before I go to the stage, don't ever do that to yourself again. <laughs> that is a nightmare. <laughs> Why am I here? And then as soon as I enter the stage and start dancing, I'm like, everything is is falling into place. And I remember, why am I doing it? Because I feel that bliss. I mean, I feel the ecstasy. And I feel the ecstasy of having this body, you know, that, that uh, femininity that is um, expressing itself through through my body. And so um, I, I'd say that uh, this dance form has uh, been help, helped me and still helping me immensely to feel that connection to my divine feminine and uh, also my divine mas masculine, but that's uh, for another question, I guess. <laughs> and that would be a good question to explore. Such a mm. beautiful, eloquent answer. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, let's hear what Kulina has to share. <laughs> oh, such good conversation. Um, well, I kind of want to jump in where I was I was really connecting to what you were saying, Ravital, about um like the the restraint, how ironic and how paradoxical that we're talking about it's like restraint and, and expansion of specifically femininity, which is, which is so unique. I mean, it, it came to, to both of us, I think, through the lens of Odyssey is this idea, like we started talking about um, our, our transition from whatever our upbringing was to being a proper Odia girl in India, you know, having to dress properly, asking for permission and someone to accompany us to the market. And like suddenly what what initially for me felt like restriction um, and restraint and classical dance. It's not just Odissi, but I think all classical dances kind of thrive on restraint because um, I, I feel like as a teacher, what I'm often doing is shaving away, like carving away the superfluous or the, the excess and just refining the movement. And so the movement, finally the movement scope gets so small. And it reminds me of um, Guru Kelucharan Mohapatra, who is um, one of the, we kind of refer to him as one of the founding gurus of Odissi, um, re-establishing Odissi in recent times as a classical dance form. And also uh, Kelucharan Mohapatra is the, the style or the lineage in which both of us study. So this great guru has done um, incredible compositions of the Gita Govind and some very specific scenes like in, in, um, in a scene, one of my favorite scenes of the Gopi Vastrahara is when Lord Krishna steals the saris of the gopis while they're bathing in the Yamuna River. And so there's like this scene, which I remember learning that the gopis, this gopi taking off her clothes at the river to get naked and jump in the water. And Guru Kelucharan Mohapatra, a man, composed this choreography and the, the way that we take off the blouse and get naked on stage, it just, it like blew my mind as I was, as I was learning this, I was in a sari in front of my teacher behaving very properly. And what we kind of imagine as like, you know, a very controlled environment of femininity and, you know, proper environment. And, and then we're, we're acting out, taking our clothes off and, and, and a man choreographed this and it it could be so vulgar it could to dance this on stage 
and so many of the episodes in the Gita Govind, it's it's love making. It's taking off clothes. It's it's could be portrayed so vulgar if it were done without care. It's like talking about a difficult topic. You have to take such care in how you present each word so it's not misunderstood, and and the idea that is trying to be extracted from this poetry of Gita Govind, which is so often presented in Odissi, is the spiritual analogy, the analogy of Krishna being the divine and the gopis or Radha being the devotee and the union of the devotee with the beloved. So this is the essence of the poetry that we're trying to extract, but the scenes are often quite, you know, <laughs> quite uh, delicate to perform on a stage. And considering that Odissi is presented in a society which really controls femininity, like women, you know, dressing, covering the body and behaving with restraint um in a public space and kind of controlling that's like uh, sexuality and femininity so i just think it's this an incredible paradox that we dance in of such explicit content in our dances and yet presented with such care and control that we can talk about the most sensual experiences um on a stage in public you know i don't often see like contemporary dance for example or you know even belly dance which which i i do and it's a it's we consider it a lot of people consider it a very sensuous dance but there's a certain limit that that most dancers want we're not going to act out making love on stage and yet in a very traditional very refined, very controlled classical dance of India where we're acting out these scenes. But because of that, that care and control surrounding it, the way the costume is, the way femininity is presented, but, you know, but, but always with an air of restraint that, that we're able to talk about such um, explicit subjects um, and present it, you know, just, I just think that's amazing. That's one of the unique things in Odissi. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess I'll, <laughs> I'll close it there because I see the time. And I, I, I would also love to hear some questions from uh, some of our participants today, because um, I think, you know, one question leads to the next and the the topics start to unravel. Jennifer, you're muted. We have one um, that I think ties into, um, you know, this, this principle of restraint that I think could be really interesting to explore. So um, Isabel asked, what do you think is special about Odissi versus other dances such as belly dance? that make it for you a unique art form uh, to experience and practice? Hmm. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I, I feel like I was just speaking about one, one of, there's so, uh, so many special things about Odissi. Of course, we're Odissi lovers, devotees. Um, but but I think what I just mentioned of uh, a very measured, um, precise degree of restraint in the dance, and also I think Ravital was starting to go down that path. But it's a big it's a big path. The Shiva Shakti, the masculine feminine, that is balanced in Odissi, because what we often see uh, visually when we watch Odissi is how graceful and languid it is, but um, but when doing it, you really what you, mostly what you're experiencing is that heavy grounded um, like the the slapping of the feet and and um, the effort required for the um, really the athleticism in the dance. Um, but Ravi, tell you want to 
share a few thoughts? Um, sure, yeah. Well, I think um, there's, there's a few things. I mean, um, definitely the classical Indian dance forms all share this kind of intricacy of uh, really, um, well, the, the classical dance is also classical music. Uh, I mean, they, they are interwoven and they work together and they um, feed off each other. And uh, the rhythm is very intricate, it's very complex, and the music is, and then there's the dance technique, and then there is, of course, the, the uh, material, you know, the, the mythology, the context, and the, the um, culture, the storytelling aspect of it all. And then there is the, the yoga behind it, you know, the, the energetic sort of uh, technology of um, dislodging the Kundalini Shakti from the pelvis that, you know, open hips, the vibration that we uh, resonate in our body from the stamping of the feet in the rhythmical pattern. So that's sort of connect us with the concept of rhythm, which is the, the um, context of our, of our cosmos. You know, everything is moving in rhythm. And when we tune into rhythm, we tune into that movement of cosmic um, elements. And so there is this kind of cosmic feeling and earth grounded feeling and vibration in the body and the, the open hips and the movement of the rib cage that is sort of seducing the energy from the pelvis to, to come into the heart and sort of mature here and you know express through their creative channels. And of course, there is the nuanced, subtle, and precise way of expressing through hand mudras, especially when you come to this kind of delicate topics such as you know love making and things like that. And um, and of course there is the whole details of the face of how you move your eyebrows and your eyes and you know you how you move your cheeks and and how you sort of move everything in such a as Colina said very very subtle and precise and almost uh, you know such a small scope of movement that expresses such depth and such nuance. So I think all of that, you know, I'm just kind of going through all of this really quickly, but what I'm trying to say is that that is unique to um, classical Indian dance, for sure, on that level of uh, intricacy. And, um, and Odissi is, um, has, I mean, that ribcage movement is very unique for Odissi, that movement of, you know, agitating the whole chamber of the heart. And, um, and it, brings, it, it brings in a, a, another layer of uh, sensuality and this language, this tribangi, you know, that kind of um, movement that uh, bring more that serpentine form and flow in the body is, is very unique for Odissi in that sense. Of course, it's a very big part of belly dance. Um, I'm not really the, the one to speak for belly dance because I'm, I'm not a belly dancer, um, you know, definitely not, not professional belly dancer anyways. And, um, and uh, you know, yeah, I, I haven't studied it really. So I can't speak for it, but I think that, um, yeah, well, that's all I have to say, I guess, in terms of what's unique about Odyssey. Uh, of course, there's more to say, but uh, just a few things. Yeah, yeah, there will always be so much more to say, but uh, those were really interesting answers. Thank you so much. And um, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, offer one more question that um, Janice posted. Um, Jana said, one could say that both yoga and Odissi were for the body of young boys. It never took into account the physical or physiological body of women in terms of training. In a time of reimagining, how might one reconstruct the practice of Odissi to support women, female bodied, without losing the essence of the tradition? <laughs> That's kind of a doozy for, uh, you know, to close with, but uh, I think it's interesting. Thank you, Janice. <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, yeah, do you want to start, Colina? <laughs> I, I feel like I need to tiptoe towards that question because, yeah, it's it could be uh, an hour in itself. But thank you for that thoughtful question. <clears throat> I, um, I don't know if I completely agree that um, Odissi and yoga was built for the young boy's body, but I, but I completely understand where, where that idea would come from. Um, certainly that's been the highlight, um, like the highlighted perspective, but, um, I just, uh, hmm. I don't know. I feel like Odissi was made for maybe not my body. <laughs> you know, you look at like a young audio bodies and maybe it was made for a young, um, flexible female body, but I do feel it's very conducive to the female body. Um, I think, um, uh, the strength in the, you know, the physical aspect of the dance, the strength of the legs and the balancing of masculine and feminine energies. Um, uh, I think it's very complementary to actually how how a woman is constructed both energetically and physically um, in the training process in my personal experience like if you're training for the stage if you're if you're training for um, kind of your highest capacity of performance um, that training you know, isn't very conducive to taking rest when you're menstruating and <laughs> taking time when you're, you know, so those are like some of the practical aspects of training that that I have faced as a woman that I, um, I have, have been like compromises that I've made in my female body as a professional dancer going to the stage but uh odyssey kind of originally comes from a context of offering and it wasn't um as our pieced together odyssey history goes um odyssey comes from a temple dance tradition and when the dance was done in a more ritualistic offering sense um and also in the courts you know indian dance was also performed in royal courts I think that that allowed for, for example, just one aspect of the practicalities of being a dancer, like during menstruation, taking that time off of, of dance. But when you have the demands of going to the stage, I think it's not the structure of Orisi, but I think it's the demands of the stage that is like, um, in my own experience, I've, if I have a performance and I'm menstruating, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's like what to do. I just say to my body, I'm sorry, but you're gonna to have to perform today at your highest capacity and not take that time to kind of fall into a softer space. Um, but that's not Odissi, that's the demand of the stage of performance and of a profession. Um, it's my professional attitude that I give my best, no matter if I have a headache or cramps or whatever. Um, and um, yo and yoga, as I learn it from my um, master, there's it's very um, acknowledging of the female physiology, and there's certain things that we do and we don't do at certain times of our cycles of life. So um, I think maybe that got glossed over and forgotten sometimes how 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 yoga is presented. Um, but again, I think maybe that's when yoga is presented in more of a performative way as it is in the modern context, but there's a lot to say. I, it's, I'm not giving any final answers, just a few thoughts to throw out there, but I'd love to hear what, what your thoughts are, Ravita. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I feel, so I, I definitely second you, Colina, that I want to clarify that yoga and dance were not created to just young male bodies by any stretch of imagination, but definitely there has been popularity uh, of uh, you know, young men becoming sort of the prominent gurus of Odyssey dance and of yoga. And that's kind of uh, propagated more of this um, maybe anti-feminine kind of practices so it's just basically a lack of uh, 
of uh, understanding some level of ignorance perhaps in how to to work with women and what uh, female bodies are all about so I again I understand the sentiments this question of uh, you know is coming from but I don't necessarily feel um, I mean Odissi is a classical Indian dance form that was reconstructed in the 1950s based on um, Gotipua which was a, a art form for boys and Maharis which was exclusively women female dancers and um, you know some other kind of uh, folk arts and a lot of um, uh, scriptures and sculpture art that was informing and inspiring the reconstruction of Odyssey dance and just a lot of kind of indigenous art forms actually that fed into this uh, new structure. But when um, one thing that I'm very passionate about is um, to adjust and to adapt Odyssey dance training to the needs of the students who are having the, the means and interest to arrive in the classroom. And for me, in my years of teaching, most of my students have been um, female for sure. And most of them were, I'd say, more mature women, not necessarily young women, not uh, children and not teenagers maybe somewhere in their 20s, but the uh, vast majority of my students have been older women, 30s, 40s, 50s. I've always welcomed women or, and, and men too, but uh, people of every age and every um, physical ability into my classroom because I find it, uh, well, because I'm so passionate about this art form and I welcome the challenge of trying to find how we can sort of uh, come, uh, find a meeting uh, place between what they can do and what I can offer to, or what this art form can offer. And absolutely, um, I do think there is some kind of, a, we need to make some kind of a distinction of whether you are practicing to be a performance artist in Odyssey or if you are studying ODC for your um, self um, growth and empowerment and development, and, and maybe you, what you learn out of the practice is uh, so it going to transform you in some way that some other kind of art form will come out of you or some other kind of expression will come out of you that is not necessarily gonna be ODC. So you can say I'm inspired by Odyssey dance. I'm a lifelong student of Odyssey, but I'm not um, in a space or a place in my life where I am going to perform the pure classical art form, but I'm going to utilize elements in it in my devotional practice or in my uh, creative expression. And so if we have that attitude, there is so much that can be done and absolutely we can keep uh, the, the integrity of the um, dance form intact and also modify a lot of the practices to fit the bodies and uh, attitudes that come our way. So, yeah. Oh, I love that answer. I love both of your answers and uh, I can attest to the fact that um, you're really generous in that way and you know that the art form does have just so much to offer for personal growth and you know to learn about the world and a different culture and our bodies and feminine and masculine so I really appreciate how both of you make that accessible and um, the transmission you bring in your own unique ways. So really, really rich questions and um, very, very interesting answers. It just whets my appetite for more. But for today, we're going to come to a close. I wonder if um, either of you have some closing remarks you'd like to make. Uh, for me, I want to say I'm so happy that we have two more sessions. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, yeah, I, I find it uh, very enriching and I enjoy very much the, the company and the platform. 
So I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. Absolutely. I feel the same way. These are important and enriching and um, yeah, beautiful conversations that I think um, I think we all love this dance. I mean, many of us are, I think, here because we are attracted to this art form um, because it gives us so much beyond just the, the physical practice. There's so much to discuss and to discover about ourselves through discussing it. So thank you for creating this space to have these conversations. And thanks to everyone for joining us. This is really beautiful. I, I hope to hear more questions. And I'm just, yeah, I'm really curious where all of these conversations and threads are going to lead us. Yeah. Bravo. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your insights. Um, I just want to tell everybody that we have two more sessions scheduled. Next week, we're going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of ODC, unique elements of ODC and the art of adornment. That's one of my favorite things about ODC, although I have a lot of favorite things about ODC. And then um, the following week, we're going to um, dive into culture, history, and the contemporary ODC dancer. So I just want to say once again, because somebody again asked about the recording, recordings may be available sometime in the future. We don't uh, intend to make them available uh, immediately right after these sessions. So um, please do try and attend live and, and maybe at the discretion of Revital and Colina, they will be available at some point. Um, but at this time, we don't know. And thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Colina and Revital. Um, I really appreciate this beautiful space and this amazing art form and uh, everybody that cares about it and loves it as much as we do. Until next time, mm -hmm. namaste and karataka, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and if everybody wants to, if anybody wants oh. to mute themselves to say goodbye or hello, um, please feel free to do so before you go. We have <laughs> lots of comments, lots of gratitude, lots of love coming in the comments right now. So nourishing. It was a pleasure, beautiful and grateful. It was so enriching. Thank you so much. So grateful and overwhelmed with joy to see the convergence of these two beautiful teachers. Yes, me too. Thank you, love you. Thank you so much, namaste, deep bows. <laughs> lots and lots of love still coming. <laughs>